Coming up on DTNS, best guesses from reliable sources on new Apple computers coming this year. Google taunts Australia over plans to make it pay for news. And Allison Sheridan helps us wrap up our CES coverage with a few cool finds. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, January 15th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm Allison Sheridan of the Podfeet Podcast Empire. Drawing the top tech stories from the home of the Cleveland Browns, I'm Len Peralta. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Hey, folks, we were just talking about uh, breakfast and how important it is. Is it the most important meal of the day? Find out. Uh, become a patron and get good day internet at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Amazon launched the Alexa Custom Assistant. I promise I'll only say that the one time. A service that lets third-party companies create their own virtual assistants themselves. Companies can set their own wake words and create custom voices with unique capabilities. Amazon says that these custom assistants will coexist with Amazon's own assistant on platforms with voice requests outside of a custom assistance functionality routed to Amazon's. Fiat Chrysler is the first announced partner working on its own custom assistant. The Oregonian newspaper reports incoming Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger told an all-hands meeting, quote, we have to deliver better products to the PC ecosystem than any possible thing that a lifestyle company in Cupertino makes. One presumes he means Apple, not the target on Stevens Creek Boulevard. Meanwhile, Intel updated its NUC lineup of performance mini desktop computers to include 11th gen Intel processors, Wi-Fi 6, some models with Z graphics. The NUC Pro line will be available to drive up to 8K displays with some vPro enabled CPUs in there. A new model, the NUC 11 Enthusiast, codenamed Phantom Canyon, offers a Core i7 1165G7 CPU and NVIDIA RTX 2060, as well as two Thunderbolt 4 ports and a 2.5 gigabit Ethernet port. SimpleNuck.com lists that one starting at $1,349 for the model that includes your hard drive and RAM. Researchers at Mount Sinai Health System in New York and Stanford University in California have found a way to predict if users of Apple Garmin and Fitbit watches have COVID-19 before the virus is detectable in tests. The Mount Sinai study analyzed Apple Watch wearers for heart rate variability, which is a known marker of inflammation. People infected with COVID-19 experience lower heart rate variability. Stanford monitor, monitored wearers of Apple, Garmin, and Fitbit devices and found that 81% of coronavirus positive participants experienced changes in their resting heart rates of up to nine and a half days prior to the onset of symptoms. The researchers could predict infection in two out of three of those infected. Back in October, security researchers noticed on Mac OS Big Sur that Apple's own apps were bypassing third-party firewalls, security tools, and VPN apps. This was the result of the content filter exclusion list included in the OS. Apple said that list was temporary, and an Apple software engineer told ZDNet it was necessary because of some bugs in Apple apps caused by the network extension framework, which had replaced the deprecated network kernel extensions. But that's all under the bridge now. Apple has removed the content filter exclusion list in macOS Big Sur 11.2 beta 2. A lot of security news today. Security mm. researcher Jonas L. warned about a Windows vulnerability earlier this week that could trigger hard drive corruption if your computer unzips a file or accesses a folder with a malicious shortcut inside it can also work if you paste the offending code string into a browser address bar. While a reboot should repair the issue with check disk, this may not always work. So Microsoft is working on a other fix for a future release. Will Dorman at CERT, CERT, says the vulnerability has existed for years, and he's reported similar vulnerabilities that just haven't been fixed. All right, let's talk a little bit about rumors coming from, from all the top uh, Apple uh, predictors uh, and and one up and comer. Sarah, what do we got? All right. TF International Security's Ming Chi Kuo says that Apple will release two new M1 based MacBook Pro models, that's the Apple Silicon model, this year with a 14 and 16 inch screen. And the first redesign since 2016, the new MacBook Pros would reportedly have a more angular design similar to recent iPad Pros. 
Quo also says that the touch bar will be replaced by physical keys. <laughs> it's going to make some people happy out there. And there will be a wider, a wider range of ports, including a MagSafe charging port. Hmm. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman, who is also has great Apple sources, corroborates the predictions and adds that the displays will be brighter with higher contrast. As for iPhones, YouTuber John Prosser, a notorious leaker, says that Apple is testing chemically strengthened ceramic shield folding glass along with a Samsung OLED folding display panel in its folding iPhone prototypes. Again, we're talking about prototypes, or we're talking about rumors, but might be something that Apple is working on. Ming-Chi Kuo also reported that Apple is aggressively testing a vapor chamber cooling system for iPhones and says it may not be ready for 2021 devices, but Apple is working on it uh, nevertheless. And then back to Mark Gurman over at Bloomberg, who says that his sources say that Apple will refresh the iMac and introduce a pair of Mac Pros this year. The iMac supposedly will cut down on bezels, remove the chin, move to a more flat back design similar to the Pro Display XDR. The upgradable Tower Mac Pro would get a refresh and may keep Intel processors because, you know, some of the M1s are going to replace the Intel processors overall, reportedly. But an M1-powered Mac Pro would get a new form factor at half the size with the aluminum exterior. And German also says it might make you nostalgic for the G4 Cube. Kind of the, you know, the form factor we're talking about here. Apple may also come out with a more consumer-targeted external monitor. So Quo and German have great records at cultivating sources that give them information that not always, but mostly turns out to be correct. Prosser is more like 50-50, uh, but he's had some in intriguing correct predictions. He always has the flashier ones like foldable prototypes. Uh, uh, Allison, of all of these predictions, uh, which one do you think catches your attention the most? Well, I got to say, it's going to be an expensive year at the Sheridan household. <laughs> <laughs> if all Tom of these I, end up being true, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tom and I have always been uh, upgrade buddies on the MacBook Pros. We've done it in step three years in a row, or three times in a row, I think now. Three generations, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I can't wait for the M1-based MacBook Pro higher-end models. And uh, to be honest, you know, I've I've had the 16-inch for a couple of years, and and it's big and it's heavy. So what I'm wondering is whether the M1 14-inch might end up having enough power, since they're so much more powerful already than the 16-inch I have. Maybe we could go down to 14 inches, Tom. What do you think? Oh, no. Oh, no. No? no. You're all about the I, I big want, display? I want more screen size, not, not less. I don't care about the weight. You, but that's, you've that's got, you've got your, at your desktop that you're sitting at right now, you got the big screen. You yeah, really want I a big... I take the laptop away from here sometimes, and then I miss yeah. that big screen. I guess. Yeah, I don't know. I've been rocking the 13 uh, inch uh, form factor with the Pro. Now it's really my MacBook Air, which is which is my new M1 MacBook Air. But that works for me. But yes, I get it. When you have a certain screen size you want, that's what you want. But it's so heavy. What I am actually excited about, strangely enough, is it, mostly M1 in all of these models. But the idea of new form factors is really fun to me. I, I, it's sort of like when the car companies used to add, you know, they used to add fins to a car to make people <laughs> buy them again, as you want people to know you have the new one. But I've got the 2019 and the 2016 MacBook Pro, and supposedly the one is an inch bigger. It's really only about a half an inch bigger. But they look exactly the same. So I grabbed the wrong one, and it's running the wrong operating system because I had them on two different different OSs. So I would love them just to look different. I think that would be really fun. I love the idea of an upgradable Mac Pro that was a, a smaller version like the Mac Pro Mini. I think that that's, uh, could be, that could be really interesting. I, but it was the upgradable one that kept the Intel processor in the old form factor. They oh, okay, didn't mention okay. whether the new M1 powered Mac Pro that's smaller would be upgradable. What would make it a Mac Pro then? What's I mean, it? it would be like the old Mac Pro. Remember the the trash can, the first one. Okay. That, that just, they were like, just you, you just plug size. stuff into it. You don't you don't get to you don't need to open it up. So isn't it called a Mac Mini then? No, it's the <laughs> Mac Pro because it's got the yeah. higher level specs inside. More but more of it. We haven't even touched on the idea of a foldable iPhone, Allison. I is just, this something that you would want, or I does it seem crazy? Completely don't want that. I don't uh, but but I'm always wrong. So we should keep that in mind. I mean, I'm wrong about what people want, and then I'll turn out to go, oh, it's the coolest thing ever. You're the anti-Ming-Chi Kuo. You're just usually wrong. Just wrong. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, well, in, in predicting what is what we need, I mean, mm -hmm. I am always telling mm -hmm. people I'm the one who said you never needed a bigger display than the, the 512K Mac. 
you know, it was like eight inches on a side. I was like, oh, how could you need anything bigger than that? So I'm um, very curious about this idea that they would put more ports in there. That feels very unapple like. Uh, I'm, I, the fact that they get rid of the touch bar makes perfect sense to me. Mm. Mag safe returning. I don't know how that works. If you continue to do USB-C, I don't want them to make the power port not be USB-C. So I don't know, maybe right. it's a, an attachment that can that, come off with the USB-C. That's what I read it attached. as. Yeah. But they all the USB-C stuff that Apple has, has, you know, you know, they're kind of all in on that. I love the idea of saying, also, if you want to do a little wireless charging, and they didn't say that, this is, again, just, you know, mm. what, what analysts think might happen. But if it's, if we're going the way of wireless in general, you know, the, the way that the iPhone 12 now has that capability, um, it's just a, you know, just a, just one more notch toward the future. So when you, th when you were thinking MagSafe, you mean set the laptop down on a charger? No, I thought you would, it might, might be a convertible, like something that goes into the USB-C port that mm -hmm. is a MagSafe charger, then becomes something that you can charge another device with when you're sitting at your laptop. Uh, okay. I thought we can do that right now with the MagSafe charger. I, I no? thought it was, I thought it was, I thought, I, I imagine it being a thing that goes on the end of the USB-C cable. That uh, pops that, off. That part of it sticks in the USB-C port on the computer, part of it sticks on the USB-C cable, and then it can pop apart safely. Yeah, like companies it. have been making those for quite a long time, and yeah. I've tried a couple yeah. of them, and they tend to just pop off too easily. Yeah. They're real like, easy to pop off. But Apple figured it out. Maybe. Yeah, Who knows? Maybe. I don't know. These are all predictions. We don't know. Uh, the U.S. Department of Commerce has issued new rules that let the country block purchase of telecommunications tech from China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, Cuba, and Venezuela's Maduro government, because the U.S. doesn't recognize that as the legitimate government of Venezuela. Those rules would take effect in March. That's, that's a preparatory thing uh, that would require further rules to specify what it exactly means. Uh, the president also issued an executive order Wednesday that prohibits the sale and holding of stock with 44 Chinese companies, including Xiaomi. The U.S. Department of Defense added Xiaomi to the list of companies it claims supports China's military, which makes it fall under this executive order. Now, Xiaomi says it's not owned, controlled, or affiliated with the Chinese military and provides its products and services for civilian and commercial use. Xiaomi was not added to the U.S. entity list that's the one Huawei is on that restricts the export of technology to companies. So this isn't going to stop Xiaomi from selling its products in the United States. What it will stop you from doing is holding Xiaomi stock or selling. If you have Xiaomi stock right now and you're in the U.S., you would have to sell it by November. This is an executive order that could be overturned. We'll see. But if I make uh, a chip to go into their phone and I'm from the U.S., can I sell the chip to to Xiaomi? Yeah, to Xiaomi yeah. That, you couldn't. You would need a license to do that if they were put on the entity list. But they're not being put on the entity okay. list. So you, yes, make those chips, Allison. You could sell them away. <laughs> to Xiaomi. So back at the beginning, uh, you said they issued new rules. The country will block purchase of telecommunications tech. So. Uh, from China. So doesn't that mean that Xiaomi, since they make telecommunications tech, they would be blocked? Xiaomi doesn't make telecommunications tech. So uh, phones aren't that. telecommunication yeah. tech? Yeah. Xiaomi makes handsets, which I know that's that's a phone, but they're talking about switches and things to build up like your, your 5G. Oh, okay. Okay. That's right. This is a hard story to follow. <laughs> well, and it may change soon. All right. Well, Google confirmed it's conducting experiments to determine the value of its service to Australian news outlets. Australia's government is implementing a law that would require Google and Facebook to pay publishers in order to carry links to new content. Google is blocking news sites from showing up in search results for about 1% of Australian users. The law would force Facebook and Google to negotiate the amount of payments or have an arbitrator decide for them. It's being debated in the Senate. This hmm. is hilarious uh, in one respect. It's not funny at all in several other respects. But uh, Google is basically taunting Australia, saying, well, we're just doing a test to see what would happen because we don't want to be forced to pay. The, the thing to remember about this Australian law is it doesn't give Google or Facebook an option. And it's specifically for Google and Facebook. It's tailored for them. <laughs> and it says you have to pay if you want to link to news content. And we've provided a framework for you to negotiate what that payment will be, and you have to participate. So your only option then 
would be for you to say, we will no longer link to news things. We, we would just stop doing that business. That's what they did in Spain. They took down Google News, but they still link to news sources in Google search in Spain. In Australia, they're saying, we don't care where it is. If you're Google and you're doing it, you have to pay. And so Google's showing, well, this is what is gonna happen if we get rid of 1% of the people who find your news articles through our website. Do you really so want I, that? I've always, I've always wanted to have this conversation with somebody. It seems to me like there is a middle ground in this one. It used to be that if I did a search, I'd get a whole bunch of links. And I could look and I could see, okay, this one's New York Times, this is whatever, you know, I could see the different sources, but I couldn't read right there on the page everything I needed to know. Now, when I go to a Google search and I like if a perfect example is how to, how do I do something? It'll immediately show me all of the text of the article that says how to do something. So I don't ever follow through to the link and those people lose that link traffic. So isn't there an intermediate way of doing this? Oh yeah, and, and those have been tried. And what Google has done in those cases is turned off the descriptions and said, oh, okay, if we have to pay for the snippets, like you say, we'll just turn them off. Uh, and so then Spain said, now you have to, you can't even, even if you turn off snippets, yeah, if you're doing Google News, if it's a news majority thing, you have to. And Google's like, great, we just won't provide Google News in Spain anymore. So they didn't accept the, the no snippet option. Uh, the, the, the governments did not, correct. Okay. Huh. They said, well, but that doesn't help because then you're not paying uh, the news companies. And honestly, without the descriptions, fewer people click. The descriptions make you click more. Really? I, get, oh, I see for the sure. description. I go, oh, there's the step-by-step, -step, how to enable blah, 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 and such and such well, an application. Does, like, let's it. not confuse the issue. That's how to, and it's a whole separate thing. Oh, We're okay. just talking about news okay. stories here. This doesn't apply to every other website. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's I mean, a headline publishers. may be, you know, you may be like, yeah, I'm very interested. But often it's the headline plus that little blurb right under the headline where I'm like, ah, yes, I'm actually interested in this. And that's what Google's like, we can get rid of that. You don't want that. We'll get rid of it. But it's not actually getting rid of linking to. Right. The Which you would think the how-to sites would be the ones up in arms, like you said, Allison, because sometimes you don't even need to click if you see all the steps. Yeah. Whereas the news publishers where they're like giving you a little bit of the information, which once you have a little bit of the information, generally people have found you're more likely to click because you're like, oh, I want to know more about that story. Whereas if you're just given the headline, sometimes you're like, I don't know what that means. And you move on. Right. Uh, it's the news sites because, in my opinion, it's the news sites because news is losing more money. How to sites are making lots of money. So they're less likely to complain about this sort of thing. All right. Well, that'll be fun to watch, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. I have a feeling the Senate's not going to buckle. Uh, I have a feeling this is going to get ugly, and Facebook mm -hmm. and Google are going to stop linking the news in Australia, and Australia's going to try to force them to say, well, you have to carry news now, and we'll see how that goes. Mm -hmm. uh, folks, if you want to join in the conversation about this or any other topic, head to our Discord. You can join it by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Well, CES is over. Remote CES for almost all of us. And we talked about, <laughs> boy, did we talk about a lot of stuff over the last four or so days, but there's always more, always more that comes out of CES. And Allison, you've always been historically so good at drumming up some of the things that you are interested in. Maybe you've seen that other people haven't seen. Has the remote version of CES for you been any different this year? Well, I do say want to say that I, I wish I was in a booth that was maybe six feet across with all of us together, <laughs> Steve on the floor watching. With our sandwiches. And, and yeah. trying to, and trying yeah, to. You're not you the know. first person to, to notice that difference. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. And now I didn't find a, 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 lob, a, a smart lobster trap this year, but I did find oh. a couple of things that I, that was my, my favorite last year, that but I found a couple one. things that I thought were interesting. Uh, one thing I've done is I go to the booth that I think most of the boys don't go to. So I go to the uh, smart breast pump and the, uh, you know, the baby stuff, you know, I, it, a, lot, a lot of times I found things that I found later on my daughters have used uh, for their, for their new babies. So uh, like Mama Roo was one of the first ones. Um, so this time I went and talked to a company called Hatch 
Um, they have a device called a Rest Mini, and it's a little tiny sound machine. And sound machines are pretty simple, right? They make white noise, you leave the room. You know, maybe you've got volume control. But the idea of their smart sound machines is they allow you to change the volume without going into the kid's room where they're sleeping. Now, my first question was, well, why would you change it if the kid was sleeping? And she says, well, what if you're going to vacuum? Maybe you want to turn the sound machine up or you know the trash truck's coming. But they, they also are going to have a, a subscription service for kids that will read them a bedtime story. And she was quick to say, you know, after you've read them a bedtime story <laughs> and they want another bedtime story, it could do that. Or it could play soothing music for them and transition between sounds. Um, this company, Hatch, also has um, something called Restore, which is an adult version that helps you improve habits with routines to get you to sleep better. So mm -hmm. like you can set it to say, I'm gonna, I want a, a light, uh, perfect for reading for 10 minutes. Then I wanna go into some meditation and I wanna have some white noise after that. And then I want an alarm that will start waking me up as the sun rises. And I thought those, those products sounded pretty interesting. That's from hatch.co. Oh yeah, I have served as a uh, a human version of this for my niece, where uh, my my uh, my sister in law was tired of reading stories, so she FaceTimed us and said, "Now, <laughs> Tito Tom will read you some stories." Uh, and and so yeah, I think you know this is part of the. It, it may not be an essential for people, but that sounds like a, a cool thing to help with the negotiations over bedtime. Yeah, and it wasn't expensive. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, the the um, the hatch mini that they came out with is forty dollars. So okay, these yeah, aren't these aren't highly expensive bad. things. So we've all been struggling with uh, trying to get our video and audio working for all the working from home and being on Zoom calls and everything. Sure has come out with another uh, USB mic uh, they call the MV5C, and it's part of the Motive line. And what was impressive about it in, in the very quick live demo that they did for me was the noise rejection. Um, she had it, uh, you know, unplugged it and used a regular mic and then plugged in this uh, the Shure MV5C, and it was extraordinarily good. It, it, the, the noise rejection was fantastic. Plug and play, condenser mic, 100 bucks. I, I love Shure equipment. I'm using a Shure MVI for my mic interface right now and uh, just, you know, simple. And I, I would buy this for everybody I know whose audio is annoying on their Zoom calls. <laughs> I, I had a conversation about this just recently with someone who was, you know, trying to start up a podcast and has a mic and it was USB under the computer. And I was like, I mean, I'd tell you to get an amp, but you have other options. But something like this, you know, if it's if it's a USB mic um, or USB convertible mic, right, straight into your computer where you don't have to buy a lot of hardware mm -hmm. um, and, or, or don't just necessarily want to manage that or learn how that all works and has some great noise rejection. I mean, more more than ever now. That is a great product, especially for a hundred bucks. Yeah, and she wasn't wearing headphones and it was spectacular. I mean, there was no feedback or anything on it. And it was in, um, wow. I'm not sure where, I think it was a Zoom room. Yeah, it was, it was really, really good. So I've got a ton of home security stuff. I've got alarms on the windows, you know, and I've got uh, I've got cameras all over the place. But I was really intrigued by a company. Uh, Origin Wireless has something called the Hex Home Security Device. And it's basically a device that throws Wi-Fi waves out into the air in your downstairs. And then if people walk uh, through it, they interrupt it. And they describe it as being like if you've got a, a, you know, you drop a pebble in a pond and it throws out a wave. Well, if something disturbs that, you can measure the disturbance in the wave. And what was great about this was the absolute simplicity. They had the, um, I think it was called the the command module, the command you plug into the wall and, the, and, and it had a little cable on it. And that's the thing spitting out the Wi-Fi. But then you had these little uh, devices you just plugged into an outlet. They were, you know, I don't know, maybe two inches across little round thing plug it into an outlet and you put a couple of those around the around the downstairs and you can measure whether somebody has come into your house and they, and they were they were definitely pointed out you don't need if you have a 3000 square foot house but 1500 of it is on the ground floor you only need something to cover that 1500 so it was only like um oh what did i thought i wrote down the price but uh it was oh, $180 in spring of 2021. It'll be coming out, but it was just super simple, not a lot of junk and seemed to, to do an interesting uh, job of uh, detecting people walking around your house when they shouldn't be. 
Yeah, we, we talked on Monday about Linksys Aware, uh, which expands to now not just be the Wi-Fi, but also uh, incorporate like Internet of Things connected devices as well. Uh, but if you don't have a Linksys router that can do Linksys Aware, but you still want to add that capability, this is uh, the Hex is a, is a great option for that. 180 bucks starts to be like, well, maybe I should just get a whole new router, but maybe maybe you have a router you love and you don't want to replace it. So it could be good for that. Yeah, I thought, I thought it just looked simple. I liked it. Mm -hmm. um, the only other thing I was thinking about, and, and I haven't dug deep into this yet, but um, it seems that Apple people, I might be a little bit of an Apple bias here. Apple people tend to talk about the, the Apple Pro XDR display for $6,000, or they talk about the LG 5K display. And we pretty much turn our nose up at all the other displays. And um, But I, I went in and talked to ViewSonic, and they've got a ton of USB-C displays that are doing some really interesting things. I mean, they've got 8K displays, and uh, and I'm going to go talk to them some more about what they've got. And I told them, I said, you guys are pretty much invisible to the Mac community. We never talk about ViewSonic, and you seem to have some really nifty stuff. So let's have a conversation and see what I can learn about them. I mean, Allison's not kidding. She literally turned her nose up at my 38-inch <laughs> Dell earlier today. So. Really? A Dell? Yes. <laughs> Gorgeous. Come on, it's a nice monitor. Dude, I got a Dell. Uh, I have some stories about Dell, but okay. A couple of podcast industry stories worth mentioning here. Podcast Media LLC, uh, which is a consortium of NPR, New York Public Radio, Chicago Public Media, and a small investment from BBC Studios America, is considering selling Pocket Casts. They just bought them in 2018. NPR spokesperson Isabel Lara told Current.org that the plan of sale of Pocket Cast is in early stages of development, but... That confirms that it is something they're they're considering. And then a uh, related story, the information and Bloomberg sources both say that Apple is talking to production companies about launching a paid subscription service for podcasts. Some of the sources mentioned charging for individual podcasts, so maybe not a subscription or maybe making them available on an individual basis or also bundling with a subscription. We don't really know. They, they're probably considering a lot of options. They may not do any of them. Uh, in fact, Bloomberg sources say uh, they may are they are looking at increasing funding and marketing uh, for new shows that Apple would put out originally. But some movement in the podcast space, on the one hand, selling Pocket Cast may indicate that this was not as lucrative as NPR and uh, friends had hoped. On the other hand, it looks like Apple is ex say, saying we want to get a slice of that pie, a bigger slice than we have. Yeah, on the Apple side, I mean, the idea of paying a la carte for individual podcast episodes sounds a little crazy, but that's how Apple Music started. You know, it's 99 cents. You want a song? You know, you want an album? Well, it's, you know, more like $7.99 or, or, or whatever the album mm -hmm. was. The idea of this uh, from Apple, and Apple has really shied away from the whole oh, we want exclusive podcasts or, you know, we're, we're buying media. I mean, it's a different world for Apple now. I mean, Apple uh, TV Plus is a great example. It doesn't have all the hits in the world, but it has a few. And people are definitely paying a subscription fee for that type of thing. As far as podcast media, LLC, uh, selling off podcast uh, pocket casts, um, potentially, it sounds like, you know, the idea of having an app that was yours was great at the time. But again, if your content is available anywhere that people are, and Pocket Cast is very, very popular um, podcatcher, then yeah, you might kind of go like, why do we have this? Maybe somebody else can do something else with this. I'm interested in the uh, being able to do a subscription service for podcasts because there are people who have made a go of selling their podcast episodes. I, I work for Don McAllister for Screencast Online, which is a tutorial service, and uh, he had to roll his own in order to do that. But what if there was a way to be part of something where you could get paid for creating your content instead of having to roll your own? If they could help podcasters do that, um, I'm still a huge fan of the free the free model, that's for sure. And but I think that could be that could be interesting. I mean, we use Patreon for that, uh, right? And and they provide RSS feeds and and everything. Uh, but you know, sometimes I'm lo I look at it and I'm like, gosh, if there was a service that was just for podcasters, they could do so many different features that pod that Patreon can't really prioritize because they're trying trying to serve so many people. So that is interesting to me. I could see daily tech headlines if it were available to anybody in any podcatcher, and that's where I'm like, well, Apple's probably not going to do that. But I could oh, see putting right. it out as a paid alternative to the ad supported version. Mm -hmm. uh, on 
I, I do want to note there was a CNBC story that city analysts uh, wrote a note to clients today that Spotify's bet on podcasting may not be working out. Uh, the idea was that bringing exclusive content to the app uh, would strengthen the advertising business, but analysts are saying that the company uh, is not getting the positive inflection. So that and the pocket cast make me think, all right, part of the industry is moving away from it, but Apple's but like finally say, but getting into it. So I don't know. And those were for a specific, you had to go through their client. That's and like the Joe that, Rogan podcast, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I think that might be part of it. And I could see, I could see Apple doing it in a way where maybe you could use other clients. If it's, if it's only for Apple client F, then I'm, I'm back out. Yeah. Maybe what we're seeing is that exclusivity, not a great thing. Although pocket cast wasn't doing exclusive podcasts. So I don't know. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. Uh, so Tom has an editor's desk um, at regular one. And the latest was about AWS, Amazon web services, dropping parlor as a client. A lot of people have thoughts about it, depending on where your thoughts are. Gabrielle wrote in, and a lot of people wrote in, but Gabrielle wrote in a really uh, a sort of lovely feedback. She said, well researched, Tom, well thought out, well presented, adhering to the known reported facts through the filters of sensible interpretation and opinion. Gabrielle says, I didn't see it as too soft or too harsh, but rather as thoughtful and respectful examination and explanation of a topic that many people feel very passionate about one way or another. Due to personal beliefs, from a personal perspective, Gabrielle says, I don't agree with all of your assessments. I think you're spot on with this one, though. And I'm here to learn and get smarter and keep up with tech news and be entertained and not just here to have somebody make me feel good about the things that I already think or believe. There's no room for personal growth in that. Just wanted to chime in for the vast majority who really get what you do, agree or not, and find much value in it and mostly just silently enjoy the experience. Thank you for having the courage to explore these topics that may result in strong feelings based on listeners' beliefs and ideologies. Uh, thank you so much, Gabrielle. You don't know how good that made me feel. And thanks to everybody else who wrote in uh, who, who said similar things about liking that episode. If you don't know what she's talking about, uh, I did about 25 minutes on AWS and Parler and that decision and how it happened and why it happened and what it means. Uh, and anybody can get that. You don't even have to be a patron at patreon.com slash DTNS. You don't even have to log in. Just go to patreon.com slash DTNS, find the posts, scroll down to the editor's desk, uh, and you can listen to it or download it uh, and listen to it somewhere else. So thank you, Gabrielle. I really appreciate that. Thanks so much, Gabrielle, and thanks to everybody who sends us questions, comments, ideas, feedback. In fact, <laughs> the email address to send all of that stuff, what's on your mind? Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We'd also like to shout out patrons at our master and grandmaster levels. Today, they include Tim Ashman, Brandon Brooks, and Tim Deputy. Let's check in with Len Peralta, who's been illustrating today's episode. What have you drawn for us this week, Len? Wow, lots to talk about this week. Um, you told me earlier I could draw whatever I wanted it to with sort of an open <laughs> bag. And uh, I decided to talk about the Apple updates, which I found quite baffling, actually. Uh, the next generation iPhone, you know, it can have this vapor cooling chamber, possibly yeah. foldable glass, all this kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, this is an image of what I think that might look like. And, uh, you know, I got to say personally, I know a lot of people, I know, I know Allison's a big Apple person. I just want to say, I think we should call it iPass because I'm like, eh, I think I'll pass on this one. Uh, I don't know. If, I don't know. May I I'd probably end up with it anyway, but because uh, I love Apple, uh, but it seems a little bit over overblown. I don't know. What do you guys think? Okay, Len, uh, that that is that is one of my favorite things you've ever drawn. I love the <laughs> I love the metal uh, the good metal look to it. The next generation iPhone featuring vapor cooling and foldable glass. Yeah, <laughs> it's so I, funny. I you know me personally, I don't know if I'm gonna end up getting it, but I probably will end up getting it. Um, uh, this is available right now if you're a Patreon subscriber, Patreon.com forward slash and it's also at my uh at my online store at lenperaldestore.com and if you're a patreon subscriber uh my discord you can actually watch me uh create this uh see uh bef hours before uh the show goes live you can watch that so so check it out uh patreon.com forward slash len allison sheridan thank you so much for being with us this fine friday in january in fact your first uh your first uh I guess post CES, really, technically, um, a, a time on DTNS this year. Let folks know where they can keep up with the rest of your work. All right. Well, if you want a completely unbiased viewpoint on tech, you go to podfeet.com. 
I mean, Actually, it's got I've an ever got... so slight bias, as I understand. Ever so slight, just a little yeah. tiny bias. <laughs> <laughs> hey, folks, uh, tomorrow, Saturday, I'm sitting down with Mike Masnick from Tech Dirt and Shoshana Weissman from R Street uh, to talk about Section 230 and what it does and does not say about social networks and what they can and can't do. Look for that in the same feed you got this episode. We are live Monday through Friday, everybody, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 21.30 UTC. If it's not already on your calendar and you can join us, we'd love to have you. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We are off Monday for the Martin Luther King holiday in the U.S., but we'll see you back Tuesday with Rob Dunwood. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>